Good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thank you for joining our China 101 um, webinar today. Um, just uh, some quick uh, details. Um, I think if you want to have the best experience, please connect uh, to the internet by cable. Also, the presentations will be shared afterwards. Um, the webinar um, will be recorded. And if you have any questions, technical issues, you can ask in the chat. Um, we have a team behind uh, the scenes to help you with any uh, difficulties. All right, so again, welcome. Uh, my name is um, Robert Gors, and I will be your moderator here um, today. Um, today, I will try, um, I will, I promise that in 15 minutes, I will guide you to this um, webinar on uh, China. So, we're going to talk, uh, discuss the basics of doing business um, in China. Um, this is uh, organized by um, Sovereign and together with Genon Innovation Zone. Sovereign is a corporate service uh, company with 27 offices around the world. We have offices uh, amongst others in um, Hong Kong, Singapore and China, but also in the Middle East and other areas. And we focus on our corporate services, our private clients and retirement planning. But today we're going to focus on China and their corporate services. So today we have two speakers discussing the three um, topics. Um, Mark, uh, the first speaker, will discuss two topics, the China market entry and uh, setting up a permanent establishment in China. Afterwards, we have uh, Jan, who will discuss the Jinan Innovation Zone and what it is and why you should or should not be there and what help they can uh, provide in um, Jinan. So then I think we should just start with our first um, speaker, uh, Mark um, Ray. He's the Managing Director of Sovereign um, China. As I said, he will speak on two um, topics, first on market um, and entry, then on structuring. Between uh, the presentation, there's ability to ask questions. If you ask questions, write it down in the chat and I will try to follow up. Um, just to, on Mark, um, he has been in China for over, I think, 15 um, years. Um, I think he's really uh, an old China hand. He has advised hundreds, I think, uh, over five, 600 of companies um, on different industries. And I think what is key about Mark is that he's making complex things very simple. So uh, I, I, that you'll probably also see in his presentation. So I say, Mark, um, here you go. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Robert. So uh, basically, the first presentation that I'm going to be talking about is really just entering the China market. Uh, so you know what can possibly go wrong. Um, just a very quick uh, preemptive to these presentations is we don't have a lot of time, and so I'm going to be taking a very complicated topic and going through it very quickly. I'm going to try and hit the the key points to it, but please uh, just uh, have some questions at the end if if anything. Uh, if anything doesn't make sense. So the first point I really want to make is the perception of China is that it's this wonderland, right? Uh, it's like you're Alice at the gates of wonderland. Everything's big, everything's massive, everything's alien. Uh, nothing really makes sense, uh, yet there's opportunity galore, right? But the reality of, of the China market is that it's a minefield, right? Uh, you're going towards a target, Everybody's out to get you, one wrong turn, and everything can be finished very quickly. So it's important to really plan how you uh, will be entering the market, or even if you should be entering the market, quite frankly, because it's not really right uh, for every company to be entering. Uh, and so one of the questions we have is, you know, why? Why is China such a challenging market? And the, the first, and there are more reasons than what I'm going to talk about, but the first reason really is just quite frankly, just the size uh, of China. I mean, it's it's larger than Europe. It's geographically, it's slightly larger than the United States. So this is a massive market. Uh, even you know when I'm I'm helping clients, we're talking about entering the U.S. market or European market. You know, we're talking about entering Germany and then maybe entering the U.K. Uh, whereas a lot of people look at China and say we're just going to enter China. And so when you think about entering China, which is a massive market, you, you may need to think about, well, let's focus on some geographies first, because it is uh, geographically diverse. Uh, and for example, 
what goes on in Shanghai is going to be very different. The mentality, the way they do business is very different than Beijing or Guangzhou, which is in southern China. Next. Next slide, Robert. Um, so the second and probably one of the more frustrating aspects of China is that the regulatory framework is, is very difficult. In fact, it's extremely, uh, I like to call it's a rule by law versus a rule of law country. Robert, you can click in on this. Um, right. So in rule by law, rule of law, basically, it, it you use rule of law, you use the laws as um, a way of guaranteeing everybody's rights as a way of um, protecting everybody. Um, rule by law basically means that uh, the laws exist. Uh, they are, but they're not necessarily enforced. Uh, they tend to be enforced when the government wants to enforce them. And so you may find a lot of people you know who have been in China who say, oh yeah, you know, we can do this, that's no problem. And somebody else say, well, wait, that's illegal. And they say, yeah, but that's not a problem. It's nothing's ever happened to us. Um, that's fine, and that's very true, and it, it can be the true true for many years. Uh, but when the government decides to go after you, they will and they can. Um, also, an uh, interesting or, or a frustrating thing about China is it is very vague and they're confusing regulations. Uh, the central government is not this monolithic um, regulatory body. They, the central government passes relatively vague uh laws so the laws are not specific and they leave it to the local governments to interpret these laws and so that's why what you'll find is if you set up in say for example shanghai or guangzhou or you're importing into these different ports that they may interpret those laws very differently and so therefore you can be quite frustrated as a foreign uh, company trying to export goods or trying to, to provide services here um, and obviously, there's very uneven enforcement. There's local company advantage where laws tend to be applied more strictly to foreign companies, which is why it's extremely important that foreign companies maintain compliance as best as they are capable of doing so. Um, and the only other thing I would say about, about the regulatory environment is just remember, uh, social stability in China is the, is the most important aspect. That's, that's the goal of the Chinese government. And so no matter what, that's going to trump regulations. So no matter how right you may be in regards to the law, if something's going to disrupt uh, the social environment or the, the social stability, that will trump any regulation regardless of, of the legality of that regulation. So uh, the third uh, difficulty in China is, is just the rapid development. I mean, uh, I think these pictures are quite famous. Which you'll, uh, the one on the left here is Shanghai. That's a picture of Pudong uh, 30 years ago. Uh, and it was basically a bunch of billboards paint, uh, facing Puxi, which is the, the west side of the, of the city and the old side of the city. And, and now the Pudong or the east side of the river is, is one of the most densely uh, packed uh, areas with skyscrapers in the world. And it has three of some of the world's tallest. Uh, so it's all this happened in 30 years. In fact, uh, when I moved here 15 years ago, the only Jima Tower, which is the smallest of those three towers in that photo, were there. So within 15 years, actually by 2008, the, the can opener building, the Shanghai Tower, and the Shanghai Tower were opened about seven or eight years after I got here. So it, it's been pretty rapid in terms of its development. And this, this isn't just in terms of infrastructure, but the way in which people, uh, go to the next one, Robert, um, the way in which uh, people dress has changed uh, drastically. Um, 30 years ago, I mean, the Mao suit, especially in lower tier cities, was very popular. Now, uh, Shanghai, China, most parts of China are extremely fashion forward, uh, more so than many Western countries, in fact. And then uh, just another, another rapid change is uh, the bicycle. You know, that was the main mode of transportation many, many years ago. And I still remember when I moved here, uh, the number of drivers were doubling every year, which is quite scary because basically that meant half of everybody on the road had been driving for less than a year. So it's quite dangerous for a while. Um, still is a little bit, but so, but you're having this this rapid transition from, uh, you know, the fashion from infrastructure to I'm, I'm not even going to go into the rail lines that they built. Um, so it's just a rapidly developing and, and the regulations, just going back to regulations, they're having a difficult time keeping up. Um, just the, the consumer preferences, they're having a difficult time. They're just changing all of the time. And it's hard to kind of 
manage the, the consumer changes uh, from overseas. So it's really quite important. Um, an interesting thing with automobiles is, is just when I got here in 2010 or so, the Cherry QQ, which was a very small, very small car, was everywhere. And I don't think I've seen one in 10 years. So it's, it's, it's just an interesting, interesting dynamic in how rapidly it's changing. Um, finally, uh, in, in this talk, and there are many more, it is, it is an immature market. And uh, the most difficult part of being an immature market is that it's highly fragmented. Um, and you could think about this, uh, talking about fragmentation, is, is just, again, you have a lot of regional brands, a lot of brands that only exist in certain cities. Uh, for many companies, this is exacerbated in terms of just distribution, right? You're going to have one company that can uh, distribute to Shanghai, and then you've got to go to a different distributor for central cities. So that fragmentation makes certain things very difficult. It makes competition extremely fierce. Um, it also minimizes brand value. Um, and so unless you're a Louis Vuitton, unless you're a Tesla, or or if somebody says, hey, I'm going to buy, this is the brand I want. I want an Adidas. I want a Nike. Um, the brand has minimal value. It tends to be uh, price-driven unless unless your brand is like an A-list brand or like that 1% um, of, of those brands. So... Local company advantage is, is kind of the next uh, difficulty. And this, this, is, um, this is very true in, I would say, most, if not all, developing markets. So this isn't necessarily key for just China. Um, but you, you can go through all of these, by the way, uh, Robert. Um, so you do have uh, pre-existing restraints on foreign invested enterprises. And what that means is you, you can't just do anything you want here. There, there is a restricted list of, of the types of activities in which you can participate or be active in, in which you can be active. Um, also, again, targeted regulatory enforcements. Uh, the government will typically make sure with a fine-tooth comb that uh, your taxes are done properly, whereas a local company, they may not necessarily do that. Um, another important one with the, tar the local company advantage is just how you treat your human resources. Uh, Chinese companies, t Chinese labor law is very strict, and Chinese la Chinese companies tend to be able to skirt those labor laws a little bit more easily than foreign companies. And this is a propaganda thing too. You know, foreign company that breaks China labor law that 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 goes in the news as you know foreigners taking advantage of Chinese, whereas a Chinese company that 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 violates China labor law, you really never hear about it. Um, Government support is is really important, um, especially this is one that we come across a lot is is just companies looking for financing from a bank or for anything. Uh, this is really limited. Uh, you don't you don't see financing available for companies. So any any type of FIE and I'll talk about this in the next presentation really needs to be able to fund itself because there's going to be very little financing options available to you. Uh, next. Robert, next one. All right, so another challenge, and this is what I like to call the corporate rigidities. Um, you know, China, people will say, oh, China's different. It's, it's very different. Um, it, it is different in many ways, but at the same time, um, it, it's not so different, but at the same time, there are differences. And so from a corporate side, you need to be able to understand those differences and adapt to them. And an example here is like uh, uh, Yum Brands, which owns KFC. Uh, they basically had the China uh, the China subsidiary self managed They basically just report to the um, the corporate headquarters. But basically, all of the policies, everything's managed locally. Because um, a lot of times, you can get this mindset where um, they're trying to apply a global uh, policy to China, which this I see a lot, especially in the areas of HR. Um, we've had a few British companies that have wanted to use their uh, their employee handbook in China, which is fine, but you have to make sure that that handbook adheres to Chinese labor law, uh, which is quite specific, which means it has to be in Chinese. Chinese will trump English or any other language. Um, also, just in terms of you know looking at corporate rigidities in terms of the, the strategic side, um, China is extremely fast moving. I'm, I'm not sure if it, it's quite difficult that I've seen for many um, foreign companies to really keep up with the, with the pace at which China moves. Um, it can happen, but it takes quite a lot of um, effort to do so. 
So the next big question really from this point is how to address these challenges, right? Um, so the first, the first thing you need to do is just ask, your, ask yourself some questions, right? And so I see at least, at least five questions that you really have to ask yourself, right? One is, are your products and services suitable for the China market? Remember, it's developing. Um, a, a great example of this is Gillette uh, when they, they wanted to enter market, I think 20 years ago with deodorant. And uh, you know there, there were two billion armpits in China, so of course you know there's a huge market opportunity for deodorant. But Chinese people very rarely use deodorant, so it just failed, right? So is it is it necessarily suitable? And there there are many um, examples of this where where the products are either too good for the China market or just not to the consumer tastes. You need to understand what the competitive situation is. If you want to come to my, my China, keep in mind everybody in the world wants to come to China, so you're not just gonna be seeing competitors that you see locally in Europe or in your local market. You're gonna be seeing South American competitors, North American competitors, other Asian competitors. Um, do you need partners? And if so, how, what kind of partners? Uh, what's the best channel to market? There are quite a few of these. And of course, the last one, and I'll talk about this more later, is, is what structure, if any, uh, is needed? You may not need one. And if you do, uh, which one then is, is necessary? So another another um, solution or, or or basically a solution to these challenges or a way to overcome these challenges is really commitment. And again, China is the second largest economy in the world. It's it could very easily become the largest economy in the world. It's it is a relatively large consumer market as a whole. Um, and and so you really need commitment. You can't just I mean you know I've seen a lot of e-commerce companies that they want to throw in like a thousand dollars a month to the to their marketing budget, and it, it's like come on it's like that that's 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 wasting your money. Um, if if you're not really going to commit to the market, uh, there's just no point in coming because it's it's just not going to work. The market is too big. There are too many competitors, um, and of course that also means you you know you need to have a commitment from upper management to come in. It's just parachuting, I call it parachuting in. Visiting China twice a year is not showing commitment. Like you, you if you really wanna be here uh, in a serious manner, you need to have uh, boots on the ground. Um, so this one is perhaps the most critical. I don't know if I have enough time to go go through with it. It sounds kind of funny, but uh, often we'll see people, we, we say don't check your brain in at the border. Um, and what this means, it's, it's really simple. If, if things don't make sense, don't do them. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of instances in which um, decisions were made in China where they just didn't make any sense whatsoever um, for even, even partnership agreements. Like, oh, we're going to partner with this guy because uh, we, we liked him. And, and you know, if you were going to partner with somebody in Europe, that's not the reason why you partner with somebody. I mean, uh, there, there's usually more to it than just, hey, we went out and had a few beers and, and the guy seemed nice. or um, or th there are many, many cases where, oh, we trust this guy because he's got a, a European passport. Um, you don't trust Europeans necessarily just because they have European passports. So it's it's just, just if something doesn't make sense, just just at least think twice on it. Um, another one is just know what you don't know. I mean, don't come into the market thinking you know everything or, you, oh yeah, I, I understand this completely. Uh, I, as Robert, Robert was in China for 10, 15 years, I think 14 years too, Robert. Um, I've been years. in China for 15, yeah, 12 years. I've been in China for 15. I don't know everything about the market. I mean, nobody does. And I think it's really interesting to, to find uh, China experts because I really don't, I, I, I'd be wary of anybody who uses that term because nobody's really a China expert because it, China's too big. Uh, it's it's too Mark, large. It's too complicated. I need me to ask you to speed up a little bit, otherwise we're gonna be in time. Yeah, almost done. Pressure. Almost done. So just just keep in mind about the China expert, and just remember to know what you don't know. Um, the next one is just really protect yourself. Um, China's what we call a low trust, shame based society. Um, so uh, don't don't count on your morals in in where you're from to necessarily translate to the same morality here. They're very different, and uh, don't expect people to lose sleep overnight if they cheat you or uh, get one up over on you on a deal. Often, uh, the next one is uh, guanxi. I may have heard this term. It's basically relationships. 
um, people say, even for us, for example, it's like, oh, you know, typically, for example, set up a company can take a month or two, and people say, oh, we can do it in a week, or you know, we we got we got connections to the government, no problem. Um, for whatever purpose it is, just remember that as soon as you use those connections, um, you're stuck in those connections, and usually those connections uh, meant that they they cut corners or somebody took a bribe, um, so it wasn't done in a compliant manner. And as soon as that person leaves, you're going to be fined, shut down, um, discontinued, etc. So next one is uh, be mindful of chabadur, right? Chabadur means like good enough, uh, right? And so this is especially important in your partners. Like if 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 you're setting up or if you're if you're you're doing things, I mean, be careful of people who are just doing it good enough. Because eventually that could come to back to bite you. Um, so you just want to really be careful that people are doing things properly and following policy. All right. So basically, um, just key takeaways: um, obtain the necessary expertise. Robert, go two slides forward. Um, you need to obtain the necessary ex uh, expertise, right? And there are three ways to do that, right? You can learn it yourself, which is the most expensive, is going to take the longest. You can hire people, uh, which is also, I mean, any you hire anybody who's good, it's going to be some money, um, but it's it's relatively quicker. And third, you can outsource uh, certain functions or partner with people. So this is these are the three ways to obtain the necessary expertise, and and really the way you want to do it is have a mix of each of these. Um, obviously, you're always learning. You hire the right people, and then you partner with with the appropriate partners. Um, finally, I would just say work with people you trust, um, which I don't, do you have that slide in there? Uh, okay. Anyways, uh, work with people you trust, uh, and just, just, and, and I don't mean trust, like, uh, have a beer or two over them, like really make sure that your business goals are aligned and that your, your values are the same. Um, anyways, also finally, you really have access to other resources and I would suggest you use them. I think Robert's going to talk about this in more detail. Um, which are basically the, um, for example, we have our market entry handbook or our doing business in China handbook. All right, Mark, okay. thank you very much for this um, overview. And we're going to go directly into the uh, second part of corporate structuring. Please keep the time in mind because we want also to give Jan ample uh, time to uh, discuss Jinan. Yeah, and how much time do I have left, Robert? Um, eight minutes. <laughs> okay, well, this, this one will be quicker. All right, so corporate structuring in China, part two. All right, so how and where should you invest, right? And so the the first thing I'm going to say is, you know, why actually enter the China market? So there's there's there are a few reasons why you actually enter the China market. Either it's an attractive market, which means you see a market opportunity, a pull factor, which means you've got somebody there who's who you're a supplier to, and they're saying, you need to come here and, and you need to set up. So we see this a lot, especially supplier to like Porsche or Mercedes, they'll have a tire supplier and they say, we want you here. Um, you see a competitive threat, um, a push factor, which means basically if you have a VC company or your senior manager says, we want to be in China. And then finally, especially in manufacturing, just cost savings, which we're seeing less of now. Um, in still some cases, there are cost savings, but we're seeing far less of that now. So in terms of how you enter China, um, this is another big big question. How can you enter the market, right? So really the difficulty and the risk for each entry method differs, right? So the easiest way to enter the market, frankly, is just to export. Like just export, find your customers, they buy it directly from you, you ship it to them, right? That's There's no capital investment, maybe invest a little bit in marketing. Finally, you can do a, a licensing agreement, right? Where somebody's building a product for you. Um, and selling, you can identify your own distributor or dealer, right? And again, at this point, you still, you're just investing time, right? Time and effort. Right? And then the next step really is investing in say what we call a representative office, which is like a branch office, uh, which is a pretty hefty investment, even though it doesn't seem like it. And finally, it's establishing a foreign invested enterprise, uh, which is the most difficult and the most risky. Next, next uh, slide, Robert. Um, and so we're talking here about establishing the FIE, but it's really the last option that you want to take. I mean, it's, it's of course, if it makes sense, do it, but you should really evaluate the other options. Say, okay, does this make this, does it make sense? 
of course, skip options if they don't make sense, and you can go straight to setting up. But, but establishing the FIE is going to be the most risky, the most difficult. It takes commitment, it takes money, right? So, and it's expensive. It is expensive, especially in China. So, comply. There are a lot of compliance um, expenses. Okay. So, what? Let's say you decide to establish in China. So, what are what's the right structure for you? So, we mentioned a, a representative office, which is is kind of light. The government's not really focusing. It's probably the simplest of the structures. It's a branch of the investment entity, right? Um, there are seasoning requirements, which means that the investing company or the company of which it's a branch of must uh, have at least two years in operations. It's an extension of the parent company. Uh, biggest limitation to the rep office is that there are limited activity scopes. So you can you can only do marketing activities. So you can't really, uh, like if you sell something, it's selling the overseas services. So it's it's really limited in the activity scope. And, and that market entry handbook uh, is more detailed on this. Next, uh, and this is the typical, I would say the typical structure for, for market entry in terms of an FIE is what we call a WUFI or a wholly foreign owned enterprise. This means that it's an investment of, it, it, it can be a joint venture, but it's wholly foreign owned, non-Chinese owned. And so you invest in China. Um, it, it is a limited liability company. That being said, uh, there is a person called a legal representative who is criminally liable uh, for uh, illegal activities of the WUFI. So it's, um, I guess, even a limited liability company in the, in the Western markets have some legal liability. But so if you don't pay your taxes or if you're involved in a lawsuit, uh, there, there are potential ramifications for that. Um, most commercial activities are allowed. Uh, there are still some restricted ones. Um, and of course, there are some cap registered capital requirements. And these are payable over 30 years. It's really just to make, the government just wants to make sure that you're, to have the ability to fund the operations. Um, the JV is perhaps the most complicated structure. Uh, personally, I don't like a JV. I think the JV should be the last option you try for. Uh, always, uh, first, it, it, it is useful if you have a restricted industry in which you want to enter. It's the next slide, Robert. Um, it can be a faster time to market. No, JV still. Uh, the the JV is still a potentially faster time to market, but there, there's a really high risk of failure. About 90% of joint ventures fail. Um, and so you should always have an exit strategy. It's like, so how can you exit out of this joint venture? Because it's likely your partner has an exit strategy. Uh, so just be careful and really ask yourself, why do I need this joint venture? Why does my partner need this joint venture? And if, if it's just because, oh, I want to give him a skin in the game or it, that's really not the reason for it. It really has to be something uh, more tangible than that. So, of course, all of these structures, except for the representative office, you can use a holding company. Um, for example, Hong Kong is a great place for holding companies, Singapore, um, BVI. Um, this can act as a buffer. It, you potentially construct it to where it optimizes taxation in terms of holding funds offshore before repatriate them. Uh, it's much easier to change the investment structure. So you think about, do you ever plan on selling the company? Uh, it's much easier to change the, the holding company versus the Chinese company. Uh, do be careful though, because there is what they call an effective management rule. So uh, if this holding company literally just, uh, this can affect your taxation. So just keep in mind of this effective management rule. Um, the next question you should ask when you enter China is, is where, where should you set up? All right, and so China, again, it's massive. Um, you have these uh, three plus one, I would say, key regions. Uh, one is the Bohai Bay Area up north, uh, the Yangtze River Delta, and then the Pearl River Delta. So these are like really key economic, economic regions, uh, very important. All of these areas are very well developed. Uh, you also have central China, which is developing. So the government is pushing, say, Wuhan, uh, Chongqing, the central, the central part of China uh, to kind of even out this development. So, so those key uh, developmental regions are important. Also, depending on your city, so you have different tiers of cities, tier one, tier two, tier three. And, and by the way, tier two now has a tier two A and tier two B. Um, so you have about 15 really advanced tier two cities that they're almost the same as tier one. Um, so it's, but it's important to kind of figure out, do you wanna go tier one or tier two cities, right? Um, so examples of tier one cities are, for example, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Beijing. Next slide, Robert. Um, 
examples of tier two cities are uh, Hangzhou, Jinan, Tianjin, and Suzhou. And these are all, I would say, that upper level tier. These are all those upper level tier two cities. And by the way, if you look at these cities, they're massive. I mean, these are tier two cities and, and they're, they're all about eight to 12 or 15 million people. So these are massive cities, lots of infrastructure. Um, in regards to the cities, uh, I'll talk about this in key takeaways. Um, for key takeaways, just keep in mind that the reasons for entry into China will be different. Is it a push factor, a pull factor? Is it uh, because um, there's a market opportunity? It's really important that you have the available resources and uh, that available resources are sufficient and you have the commitment to enter based on your uh, uh, entry, entry mode. It's a, by the way, we're two slides ahead, Robert. Next one, yeah. So when you enter the market, just keep in mind, there are different ways to enter, right? So you have the rep office, the Wolfie, the JV, or just distribution. Um, so just keep that in mind and, and make sure that that's really important. And, and again, just going back to the previous slide, just make sure you have the sufficient resources and capabilities. Um, last slide is, again, location is really important. Um, it's, it's important for a few reasons. Uh, the main one, really is just from an administrative standpoint. Uh, again, laws don't, you know, we've had issues where we've tried to set up in lower tier cities where the bank um, was was just non-cooperative. I mean, so we couldn't open a bank account. We couldn't set up a tax account. Uh, they were just unwilling, the, the government was just unwilling to really help. And so it's, it may seem like everybody really wants foreign investment, but that's not necessarily true. Also, a few things you want to look for is just access to your customers and clients. I mean, do you have the ability to access them easily? Um, are there, uh, do you have access to talent, right? So again, you're going to see huge talent gaps. Uh, shipping and logistics, right? Um, so as an example, Jinan, we have a speaker like uh, uh, Qingdao, which is a very, very close to Jinan. It's a major import uh, for, or a port for seafood. Right, as well as as well as other goods. Uh, so it's just important to kind of make sure that you understand and kind of go through the different locations, their availability, and what works best for you. All right. So Mark, thank you very much for this that's overview. It. I want to I wanted to uh, I'm gonna uh, interact. You know, um, I have a few. Um, uh, one question um, I have. You said you are very against uh, joint joint ventures, but in certain certain industries like finance uh, or medical. There is a there is a need um, for this. So uh, Ben, do you don't come to China, or do you just need to accept the JV? And what what's then your biggest advice when you enter the JV? Well, when you enter a joint venture, like for example, if it's in a it's an industry in which you have a clear need for a partner, right? A clear need. So a medical would be would be a very yeah. difficult industry to break into. So especially the pharmaceutical. So you really need a partner. Um, a absolutely. Uh, don't don't avoid the market just because you need a joint venture, but certainly vet your partner well. So perform the necessary due diligence. And then also, again, make sure you have a, a lifeboat available. I mean, you really need to have an exit plan. What happens if things go wrong? What are you going to do? And this could be, first off, what are you bringing to that, that partnership, right? Why does that JV partner in China want you to want to partner with you at all? Why do they need you? Yeah. And if there is a specific reason why they need you, protect that reason because as soon as they no longer need you they probably will throw you to the curb right so just make sure that whatever whatever assets or or knowledge or know-how you're bringing to the table that you protect those assets right of course you're a partnership you make sure you're working towards the same goal but just right. make sure they can't sideline you all right all right all right thank you thank you i'm gonna uh see if we have some questions at the end i see a few questions that we can uh um, pick up at the end of the discussion. So, Mark, thank you for this. Uh, these two parts of, of the presentation on market entry and market structuring. Um, I now would like to um, go to Jan from the Jinan um, Innovation Zone. So, Jan is European representative of the uh, Jinan Innovation Zone. He's based in the Netherlands, and I would say he's the person in Europe regarding the Jinan Innovation Zone. 
Um, I understand that your main role is to connect to European technology companies and institutions and bring them to the innovation zone. Um, I understand that the, the innovation zone is, uh, is consists of five different uh, parks, um, I understand, and already hosted uh, over 50,000 companies. So it's a big place, not too far from uh, Shanghai, an interesting uh, located, but I think Jan is much better equipped than I am to discuss the genome innovation zone. So, uh, Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Robert, and also thank you, Mark, uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, good that you also mentioned uh, the difference between Tier 1 and Tier 2 cities. Jinan is indeed a two, Tier 2 city, um, and it's good, I think, to focus uh, on the possibilities there. Um, I want to focus on the cooperation opportunities for European uh, companies there. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Menke Hopma. I'm indeed a European representative of uh, Jinan Innovation Zone. Uh, Jinan is the capital of Shandong province. So let's get started. Uh, next slide, please. We start with the main information about Jinan, uh, which you can see here. It's the capital of the province of Shandong, which is the second biggest province according to population. 100 million people and also the third biggest according to GDP. Talking about economic growth as a second tier city, it is the fastest, one of the fastest growing uh, cities in China with 4.9% uh, economic growth per year in 2020 during the pandemic, where the Chinese average growth is 2.3%. Next slide, please. So let's have a look now where Jinan is located. Here you can see the location uh, of Jinan and the Shandong province. Jinan lies between Beijing and Shanghai, is only one and a half hour to Beijing and three hours to Shanghai by high speed train. And also it connects, you see on the right, the two main economic regions, the Bohai Economic Rim in the north and Yangtze River Delta. Let's now have a to take a look at the Jinan Innovation Zone, GIZ in short, which is also called the High Tech Zone, Investment Zone, Economic Development Zone in Jinan. The zone ranked 11th, 11th place among all high tech zones in China in 2019 and has about 50,000 companies in total. Robert mentioned it already. The next, next slide, please. On this page, we can see the main guiding industries uh, and related industry parks of the GIZ. So the GIZ has four guiding industries, which you see here in the picture. Electronic information on the left, then you have intelligent equipment, life sciences, and modern services. The electronic information industry is represented by the industry park, Chilu Software Park. Chilu Software Park, you can see here below. It's the biggest round building in Asia. More than 2,400 companies are located here. And the main sectors you can see below the picture. Second, intelligent equipment or machine engineering, represented by the Intelligent Equipment City. Here are over 1,500 companies located and active in the industries mentioned below. Third, the life science industry, represented by the Life Science City, mostly focused on biomedicine and medical equipment. More than 3,000 life science companies are located there. And lastly, the modern service industry, represented by the Hanyu Gold Valley, with industries as financial services and logistics. Next slide, please. So which Chinese representative companies does the GIZ have in the different industry sectors? Let's have a closer look. First, we have INSPUR, which is uh, the key company for the uh, electronic information industry. INSPUR is China's leading cloud computing and big data service provider and also China's biggest server manufacturer. For the manufacturing industry, it's Sinotruck, you see on the, on the right side. Sinotruck is China's biggest heavy duty, uh, duty truck manufacturer. INSPUR as well as Sinotruck are both originally from Jinan. So their headquarters are located there in the GIZ. And also Geely is located in the GIZ and Bodor Laser, a laser manufacturer, a laser machine manufacturer. The laser industry is also very big in Jinan with many companies being active in the laser machine manufacturing industry. 
For life science, it's Tulu, Tulu uh, Pharmaceutical, the biggest medicine uh, manufacturer in uh, Shandong. And for modern services, mostly banks, insurance and security companies and investment funds. Next slide. On this page, and that's very interest, interesting, especially for the audience here, international cooperation. These are the international cooperation uh, mechanism of the GIZ, which make it easier also for you to establish your company or find a partner in Jinan. For example, on the left, you'll see all the current offices overseas. Me, myself, is the one in Rotterdam. But there are also offices in Germany, Finland, Israel and UK. Main functions are assisting the foreign companies with their China plans and to realize their projects in Jinan, such as factory establishment, renting, joint venture establishment, but also assist regarding looking for cooperation partners in the GIZ according to the company's requirements. The overseas offices have also direct contact to GIZ companies but also to relevant government uh, departments, which is, can also be very interesting. Further, the GIZ is hosting, and that's very important to mention here, the biggest Sino-European SME Cooperation and Com uh, Communication Conference in China, the SMEC. Every year in October, November, which has already been held for six uh, times since 2015. In 2019, there were 200 foreign participants from more than 20 countries which participated. And the SMAC aims at establishing corporations through matchmaking and also to introduce the GIZ and its advantages for foreign companies. Additionally, the GIZ has established several cooperation agreements with famous European science parks like Leiden Science Park in Holland and with Sophia Antipolis in Côte d'Azur, France. The objective is to create platforms to exchange knowledge, technology and business. Next to that, is GIZ also open for more cooperation with other science parks and technology clusters in Europe? Here you see an overview of the foreign companies in the GIZ. Most German companies as Bosch, Continental, ZF, Hengst and Vos are automotive spart, par, uh, spare parts suppliers, mainly for Sinotruck, but also companies from other countries and other industries settled down. SKF from Sweden, Peugeot from France, Hendrickson from USA. The German company Festo, I think it's also interesting to mention, a leading company in industrial automation, just built its biggest factory in the world for them in Jinan. So, Next slide, please. What are then the competitive advantage why companies should choose for Jinan as a second, second tier city compared to tier one cities and other tier two cities? I would like to emphasize the following four points. First, as we saw before, ideal geographic location and strategic location for transport and traffic. Jinan is the capital of the second biggest province according to population, providing access to a huge market. Further, it connects the Bohai Economic Rim in the north and the Yangtze River in the south. Also good for exporting because it's close to the coast and has EU freight trains departing from the GIZ. Second, it has a much lower cost level than tier one cities. Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing. This is one of the key factors for foreign companies when to decide to settle down. As China, as you all know, is not considered as a cheap labor country anymore. So the cost level here refers to wages, the living cost, and cost related to set up a factory or something. Third one, high level of education, also very important. The GIZ has direct contact with 55 educational vocational institutes. Hiring special technical staff and talents by companies is strongly supported and facilitated by the GIZ. The Shandong University is the best university in Shandong and has most campuses in Jinan. Shandong province has also the most graduates in China, like almost 600,000. And fourth, providing a soft landing through the overseas office. That's also why I'm here in Europe. The overseas offices as introduced before. So realizing China plans with the foreign companies together. 
Because of the coronavirus situation in 2020, the SMEC I just mentioned, uh, 2020, had been held as an online event. This is why GIZ developed the SMEC cloud matchmaking app, where companies can register and find related information about GIZ companies according to industry sector. Further, foreign companies have their own profile and can upload company information, their introduction, cooperation requirements, videos, pictures, and can be also downloaded from, uh, from the App Store. For Android, you download from a website. And the overseas offices can assist you in also uh, the registration process for this app. So it's also like a database where you can be found and you can find also Chinese companies. Next, please. Next, yeah. GIZ also offers preferential policies. Here you see them in the slide. The preferential policies, depending on the project scope and the different sectors, are uh, related to. You can see here. To sum it up, most applied preferential policies are related to foreign investment and also for fixed investment in machinery. Also, subsidies for factory renting or R&D resources and development can be granted. As not much, not much time left. Uh, detailed information regarding the preferential policies we can be discussed after this uh, webinar. Slide, yeah, next. Thank you. So that was it from my side. Thank you for your participation. And I hope this short presentation could arouse your interest in Jinan and the GIZ. These are my contact details, and I would be happy to continue the discussion with you and see what GIZ can offer to you. I would be happy to regard to with regard to uh, your China plans to support you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Jan, on this uh, presentation on um, Jinan. Um, I have a, a few um, questions um, for you that was I, I was thinking. So um, the question you mentioned uh, that, of course, Jinan can help uh, foreign companies, but how can, how does, the, the zone supports companies to start in, in China, for example, where, where does it start? Yeah, oh, that starts with an introduction um, because we have a procedure to introduce foreign companies with their project. So uh, we have a, a form, a document we fill in with information about the company, introduction of the company, their cooperation requirements, what they are looking for in China, what kind of typical partner they would uh, fit mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, um, we we translate that into Chinese. We share it with the companies, with the industry parks, and then uh, we see from there. So sometimes there can be uh, interested companies, and then you bring them together, and from there uh, we also support a foreign company in uh, in settling down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so all right. So you help them with settling down. Um, you help them with setup and all the all the an office that kind of. Uh, uh, help right yeah 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 just what what, what we can do is to connect uh, the company also with the the right departments uh, to connect with the right companies but i think it's also good to emphasize that uh, as a foreign company it's also good to let you support by uh, a good service provider like uh, like sovereign group for the like <laughs> the really the legal <laughs> entity the setup etc well, uh, so but my, my you mentioned it already uh, a little bit diff different topic. You mentioned it already in in second tier cities. You have you said the highest number of um, students, um, mm. and I, it's, I think it's always people think like, okay, how easy is it to hire staff or find local talent in in, in Jinan? Normally, that's that's a little bit of a of a, of a worry of people. I understand that uh, that worry, but. GIZ uh, recognizes that and also has a special uh, department, which is called the Talent Work Office, which can connect you uh, with the right uh, universities. And also there are regular uh, job markets online, offline, where you can connect uh, with the people um, you need for setting up your uh, business in China. Mm. All right. So we have a, a question for, uh, I think, for Mark is best to, to answer um, from one of our uh, audience. The question is, um, now that China has a, a slower uh, development, right, depending how you define slow, 
um, and thinking of the foreign trade, do you see any new policies coming up or to stimulate uh, this uh, this economy? Is it something where foreign companies can can use? That foreign companies can use. Um, yeah, I mean that's a good question. It's it's hard to foresee the future. Uh, during during COVID, uh, the the there were some central policies that would help relieve some of the financial burden on companies. Uh, in terms of in terms of policies that would help uh, companies in the future, it's I likely it's going to be more of the large state-owned enterprises. Uh, that's my guess. I mean, I don't really know. I doubt that it's going to. I doubt that a lot of these policies will trickle trickle down to any SMEs. Uh, but certainly there are going to be certain, perhaps uh, they extend the export re uh, VAT rebates to help with exports. They're probably going to implement some monetary policy right now. Um, so, I mean, one good or bad thing, I think the U.S. dollar just tanked against the RMB. So it's down to 6.5, which is the lowest mm -hmm. it's been in two or three years. Um, so maybe maybe we're going to see some some changes in the monetary policy where they start devaluing the RMB. Uh, so it, it really it, it's a really difficult question to ask, but I'm sure I'm sure that they will be implementing some kind of policies. The question really is, will it benefit foreign invested enterprises? Uh, maybe Jan can answer that better from a from a from a regional government point of view. Can you, can you repeat, uh, my question? So like, uh, I think, <clears throat> of course, during the, the 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 pandemic, the Chinese economy has slowed down, and of course. Um, they are different china has different strategies and was wondering like is is in any way you mentioned already during COVID, um what are maybe incentives that the gym innovation zone is particularly focusing on now to boost the economy again ah to boost the economy yes um i think the government is very active in uh, in also helping uh, the the companies survive the the, pan the pandemic um and yeah, a lot also changed. A lot is uh, has become online, more online than uh, than before. People are also um, more allowed to to, uh, to work at home, um, and also uh, the um, communication with foreign companies still, yeah, is is possible also uh, online. Because my experience is that um, last year also introduced uh, several companies and they are now working together with companies in Jinan and just starting online so there's still a lot of um, yeah uh, I've, I've heard there. I think of course I think many people say China is definitely a face-to-face -face, uh, place where you need to mm. have people's trust but I have heard Great. stories where people have connected and have signed contracts just yes. uh, yeah. by way of uh, now everything famous Zoom or other teams yes. or other Right. Yes. So I think, and I think also, yeah. they still need uh, foreign technology and they are very interested in it. And although the Chinese culture is face to face and eating and having dinner and, and making friends, uh, I think still in this time, uh, also online, uh, you can uh, yeah, start. A yeah, lot it's, of, I think uh, due to necessity, we, uh, we became used to it. All right. So, um, there, um, we are at 50 uh, minutes. All the all the content has been uh, shared. So if people um, can want to um, leave, or, uh, that's of course uh, possible. We see that there are a few questions to be asked. So uh, my idea is just to continue with the questions that are uh, are asked, uh, because I think that uh, if people are interested, they can of course uh, stay. Um, and then um, when the questions die down or we can't answer all the questions, we will answer the questions later uh, by um, email. So um, one of the, 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 the questions was on the Hainan um, zone. And I know that there's a lot of... Uh, Hainan, the, the Hainan. Oh, Hainan. The Hainan. Hainan. Okay. Uh, Sorry. So <laughs> like, there's like Jinan also. Um, has been spoken also about... Uh, uh, Mark, you mentioned the different regions. Um, Hainan now comes into um, comes into the news often. Do you, well, what is your view on on that? Um, and the question is specifically asked for medical device, but I know of course there's so many details. Uh, but uh, on that, but what do you what do you know about Hainan and how do you see that within, for example, the Greater Bay Area? Uh, well, I mean. 
the way I see it is they're trying to turn Hainan into a new free trade zone or a new type of free trade zone. Um, you're already seeing uh, it turning into a consumer hub where it, 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 we'll, we'll see if this continues after COVID where you can basically fly to Hainan and then purchase goods as though it were duty free. So as you were traveling internationally, you can purchase duty free goods in Hainan and bring them back to the rest of China. Uh, in terms of, I, I know Bo, the uh, greater Bay Area in the South is having a lot of special policies, especially around finance. I'm not really familiar with the medical device policies. I, I, I'm not really sure if, if a medical device policy would affect, I mean, it depends what you're looking to do because a, a, a lot of, to get uh, your product registered, the class one, class two, class three medical device, I think that's a national uh, classification. So I'm not sure the impact that would have uh, just being in a high end free trade zone. Uh, I do know in terms of medical devices, uh, China is extremely complicated. Um, so I don't think we'll go into it here, but it, they, their, their classification system makes it not easy. Uh, um, so I, I've, I've done some work in that area a few years ago and it, it wasn't easy. I don't think having a free trade zone, at least for accessing the China market, will make that particular industry easier, although it could uh, be easier for exports. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something it, for very specifically, I would suggest um, being very specific in the question and, and perhaps that's something we can either answer later yeah, or can, refer it to a consultant. Uh, well, I think it's going to be interesting to look at that, uh, the medical device in Hainan because this question came up. For um, Jan, there was a um, question, let's say, um, great, um, uh, I connect to uh, Jinan, we're there to help, but it, but it's, it shows that Jinan is not the right place to to be. Um, how do you then um, have the patients with how 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 do you help if it if it's not within the the, the list of of industries you mentioned? What is is Jinan still the, can still help or? Yes, yes. I mean, preferably um, it would be in the in the sectors I mentioned, um, but still uh, since Jinan and Shandong is a big market. We can still assist also uh, to help your company to uh, to settle down there, or at least to um, yeah to to have a market entry. Okay. So I would like to also encourage companies which are looking now, people uh, also when it's not like a big data or intelligent equipment, um, also contact me and we can see what what we can do. Yeah, so you're saying like it's. Yeah. A, it, you're there and uh, you're in Europe, you're a good contact point. Uh, maybe mm, not yes. Jinan, but you will know uh, a ways to maybe yes, suggest yes. either either Jinan in a different way or other locations, right? Yes, yes. Right. Mark, we got a, yep. a, a more uh, a technical question. I see uh, a question on virtual offices. I know it's a little bit that we're going into really into the into the into the um, setting up really like setting up going down to the to the mm. people. um mention people and i get this question also a lot like on virtual offices and going cheap i i, I know what my opinion is but i i want to what is your opinion on, on on virtual office and why do you um okay well i guess one it depends on what's your definition of a virtual office um in terms of i mean is it in china basically they're illegal uh, you need to have a physical office space. Uh, now, the size of that office can vary. So you can have an office space of, of, a, of one desk and one chair, and that, that could be a virtual office. Um, but in terms of just having like a phantom office, that's illegal. Uh, so, and, and, you know, we have run into situations, basically you, you do need a physical office space and the government, you do need to have that office registered at that space. And it's going yeah. to be, that space is on your business license. Um, and it, it, it's actually, it, we've run into situations where we've had uh, clients who were operating at a, an office that was not their registered address. And the police actually came to our office because we're their registered accountants. Because uh, one of the employees, I, I don't know the specifics, but uh, the police needed to get in touch with them. They went to the address in the, of, their, of their employment but it wasn't a real address. And so then they came looking to us and and luckily we had their actual operating address. But uh, I, I don't know what kind of trouble they got into later on because they weren't operating out of out of their registered address, but it is quite a big deal. Okay, all right. So, uh, so 
I, I know Posca, I think uh, just recently also we, we had a, had a um, that somebody came in into our client base who was at a virtual office and who needed to open a bank account and they couldn't open the bank account because the bank requires to do a company visit, but there was no company to visit. Uh, right. So therefore, they had issues with it. So I, I think that, I think the virtual office is a typical example of yeah. By law, it's not okay. People still do it a lot because everybody says ah, oh, it's it's okay. But in the end, it will come back to you because certain things somewhere along the road will not work because you're in a virtual office. So it's I think, uh, yeah, it's not something I also would, uh, would support. Um, and, and there are plenty of alternatives, right? So you, yeah. you, have, you have a service, you have Riga service office, you have WeWork. Um, I mean, there, there are uh, plenty of plenty of options uh, yeah, to take advantage of. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it, and yeah. Okay, a, a question, so I, I'm gonna, there's another question coming in on, on, on taxes and, and, and incentives, especially for GNAN. So there's a lot of information on uh, the question. So it says like there's a lot of information on zones giving tax incentives or tax cuts or um, um, gives um, help with um, uh, how does it say mm. with office space. But is that all okay? Like are tax incentives okay? But what does Genan give, for example? Yeah. I would not say like tax. More, it's more like investment incentives um, that you, when you invest, you get back from the um, from the government uh, a percentage of your investment. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that you can just get a tax break, but it's more, um, yeah, a subsidy or something. Yeah, because I, I think um, that it's also yeah. like the, the 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 tax incentives. That were given are not always um, uh, mm. legal, but the investments, mm. the, 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 the getting back something of the percentage of the investment you put, that's that's like an yes. investment uh, investment support. That's that's illegal, yes. but not, not another tax. And also company. like free office, uh, free yeah. lab, uh, sharing lab, uh, even sometimes mm. factory space. Yeah, there's a lot possible. Okay, I'm going to have the, the last question and then I think we're going to uh, round it. Um, one question for uh, Mark about registered capital. Um, there's not uh, like there's a difference between registered capital and investment like in, in other um, other countries where you need to put money really into the company with registered capital. You don't really need to put money into the directly into the company. But uh, the person heard something about two years of expenses. So can you uh, that you need to register to get your uh, business okay. license. Uh, so I guess the point is, is what is registered capital? Um, so a registered capital is, it's, it's, it's not money you're giving the governments so that you can set up a company. It's basically investment capital that you're gonna be using for operating expenses. And so you, you're, you get to choose what your registered capital can be. Uh, you do not want it to be too low. You don't want it to be too high. Uh, one thing about registered capital is you can always increase it, but you cannot decrease it. Uh, registered capital does have special tax treatment because it's a tax-free investment into the company, whereas if you just fund the company from overseas, that's deemed as revenue or income and is taxed locally. Yeah. In terms of how much registered capital you, you need to invest, um, whatever you write down as your registered capital, you actually have 30 years to inject that capital, unless you specify otherwise. Um, and now the question is, is there a magic number? Uh, I think you mentioned, do I need two years of operating expenses? Not necessarily. Um, but that being said, if your registered capital is too low, uh, when you go to AIC and like, let's say you, you say your registered capital is $3,000, 20,000 RMB, and you go to the AIC and your rent, your rental agreement is, 50,000 RMB a month, they're going to look at you and say, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, like, and how AI, can you possibly the invest? AIC is the organization, the AIC is the organization. Administration, that administration, of, administration of Industry and Commerce, that's the one who issues your business license. Yeah. And so it's not going to make sense. So really the way we advise on registered capital is to understand, okay, develop your business plan, business plan understand or figure out approximately how much money is it going to take you to run the company or will you need to invest in the company before you are cash flow positive? 
right? So if it's going to take you six months, it's, it's, if it's going to cost you over the next two years, $200,000 before you start turning a profit, your registered capital should be about $200,000, maybe a little bit less. If it's if you're running it through and it's probably going to be a hundred thousand U.S. dollars over the next two years or one year or ten years to become cash flow positive, profitable, that should be a registered capital. Yeah. Um, it's it's really it, there's no set amount. Uh, if it is too low, where it's just it doesn't make any sense, the ASC will not approve the business license. Um, but again, I mean, so typically, I mean, a magic number for us, we usually say about one million RMB or one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. Depending and, on exchange and rate. In mind, uh, yeah, depending on exchange rate. But keep in mind, I mean, if you, this money is used for your office rent, so even if it's yeah. that's ten thousand, if that's ten thousand RMB a month, which is relatively low, one hundred and twenty thousand RMB is a year's worth of rent. If your salaries are, you know, total salary expenses, and this includes social benefits, two hundred thousand a month, you know, that's two hundred forty thousand a year. Mm-hmm. Sorry. <laughs> two million a year. So, so the point is, is you can already you, you you can you can hit that number very quickly. Yeah. Uh, it's it's your salaries, it's it's your office expenses, it's your marketing expenses. It's just what what are your expenses going to be over the next one to two years before you become yeah. uh, positive? All right, all right. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that's these are definitely questions are uh, are interesting. They are different questions are coming in, but what I suggested that we're going to answer them offline by email mm. because then we can have a nice um, rounding today we heard about uh, market entry uh, structuring uh, the innovation zone i want to thank mark and jan providing uh, the information um, we're gonna um, tomorrow we're gonna send everybody an email with the presentations and uh, with uh, extra documentation also about jinan and you will get a free copy of our doing business in china um, guide with all the information that we discussed and of course much uh, more so with that, I want to thank everybody um, uh, for attending. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, of course, uh, feel free to um, connect with us. And thank you again, Mark and Jan. Okay, my pleasure. My pleasure, Robert. Thank you.